Hey everybody. Today I'm going to do a tutorial for you on how to make really heavily engineered snare drums, very similar to what you'd find inside of the Vengeance sample packs. Vengeance is notorious for making some of the most processed, hardest hitting drums on the market, and I've been able to figure out a technique to get really, really similar results that I've been stoked with. It uses some advanced sound design techniques, so if you're a beginner, some of this stuff might be over your head, but we're gonna be using a lot of layering. We're gonna be using synthesizers for some of the layers. We're gonna be using audio samples for some of the layers. We're gonna be using Foley recordings, some tricks with mid-side processing, parallel compression, parallel saturation, and then grouping everything together. I'm gonna to show you guys step-by-step step exactly what I've been doing. I'll show you some of the drums that I've built, and I'm gonna give you guys the template that I use to do this. So let's pop open my template inside of Ableton Live, and I'll show you guys exactly what I've been doing. First off, I wanna show you some examples of drums I've created using this technique and template. Here's a few of mine. And for reference, here are some Vengeance drums. These ones in particular are out of the Vengeance Essential Dubstep Volume 2 pack. And you can see all the Vengeance drums are actually heavily compressed and limited. That's more heavy handed than I would usually be with my snares, but because I wanted to show you guys exactly how to create Vengeance style snares, I've done similar things to mine. So these drums are also equally as squashed. Now let's get into the actual layers that make up these drums. So I have all my layers bussed together using a group track inside of Live. We'll expand that group track. At the very top you can see I have an audio track labeled reference drum. And I always begin my sound design with importing a reference drum as an example. I never try and recreate it exactly, but it gives me a loose idea of what to shoot for as far as length, timbre, loudness, and pitch. So let's turn this on, and here's the Vengeance drum that I used as a reference. And then here's the drum that I created using the subsequent layers that we'll see below. So fairly similar style, feel, timbre, loudness of drum. I'm quite happy with it, and I'm going to show you guys step by step how I made it. Now I will point out, on this reference drum track, I've changed the audio routing because I have group effects that are on all of the layers together to heavily process them. And I would never want to listen to the reference drum going through all that stuff because that would resaturate, recompress, relimit it, and it would really distort my perspective of the reference drum. So I've changed the audio output routings from my track here to bypass the group and go directly to the external out, which is going to just go straight out my master. Normally when you have an audio track inside of a group, it's going to be labeled group as the output, which means it's going to fire through any effects on the group. So that's an important piece to note here. Now. Let's take a look at the tuning. That's the first thing I, I look at when a, a reference drum is coming up. So we have a spectrum device here and I expand the spectrum like this so I can really see it clearly. And I'm gonna be looking at the drum fundamental. So you can see snare drums typically have a really defined fundamental peak, which is where the body of the drum is. And if I hover my mouse just at the peak of it, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, that I'm hovering at around 196 hertz, which is a G. Now, it's really useful to have a guide to understand what notes are what frequencies. So I have this PDF companion guide that I include in my Blitz Beats percussion sound design course. That's a, a heavy duty in-depth sound design course talking about how to build drums. And in that PDF, I have a listing of each note and the corresponding frequency. So if we want to take a look at it and we want to find that G, so here's that particular G where that snare was hitting, we can see its exact frequency is going to be 196 hertz. If I was going to tune a drum to F, it would be 175 hertz. That's a really useful reference. So we're going to build this drum using the key of G and the exact frequency of 196 hertz. The very next thing I do after figuring out the key of the reference drum is I break the reference drum up into pieces. So if we take a look at the waveform, you can see this drum is actually made of four distinct pieces. We have this bit right here, which is the transient. And then we can see the waveform fairly distinctly changes. And we have this piece right here, which I would call the, the body. And then we have 
another change as we get to about here, which is similar to the body but with more distortion. You can see more of these dark jagged lines and that's distortion and saturation, higher frequencies. And then we have the final piece of the drum, which is the noise tail, the white noise. Now what I've done below here is I've actually chopped and color coded each one of these sections and it's useful to listen to them. So I'm gonna solo this track and we're gonna to listen to each one of these pieces. So here's the transient. Just a little burst of noise, a little tick at the beginning. Here's the body. Here's the second part of the body. And here's the noise tail. So I'm gonna build my drum using a similar number of layers and pieces and we're gonna kind of Frankenstein this thing together using these four parts as a general container. Let's start by looking at the transient. So here's my transient that I created. And there's a few different ways to create these initial transient bursts. One of them is you can find a whole bunch of snare samples and just cut the beginnings off of them and then clip them out and save them in a folder. It's one of the things I do. You can also make these using FM synthesis. You can make them by using other percussion, like the beginning of a cowbell or a rim shot, and then using a lot of distortion. But the key thing is they're very short. They contain a lot of high frequencies, and they're typically quite distorted. So I started off with the beginning of another snare sample, and I've just thrown an EQ high-passing it a little bit, and the real piece doing the work here is this overdrive plugin. So I have the overdrive plugin in live, filtering it a bit, dynamic squash down, and it's 50% in the mix. So here's what my transient sounds like. Now, as I'm going through these layers, I'm actually gonna turn the bus effects off for now. So I have everything in a nice big rack up top, and I wanna let you guys listen to each one of these layers clean. So there's the initial transient. I also put a utility plugin on each one of my layers. It allows me to have gain control over each one and also the width control is really essential here. So I do certain parts of my drum in mono and then other parts of my drum in stereo. And the mono pieces are for impact. So the first transient, I always have narrowed down to zero. So it has as much punch as possible. The very next piece is going to be the synth body. And I did this one in X for Records Serum. So let's take a look at what I've done inside of Serum here. So we'll solo that, unfreeze it. And here is what the synth body sounds like. Let's take a look inside of Serum. So this is um, a custom preset that I'll include for you guys and I call it snare bottom layer. And what it's doing is using the sub oscillator I like the sub oscillator because you can choose through these useful waveforms. All of them are quite good for sound design for drums. This is a sine wave, a squared off sine, and a triangle. Those are the big ones that I use for the snare bottoms. In this case, I was looking at the reference drum, and you can see in the reference drum that it's kind of a squared off sine. At least that's the effect once it's been compressed. So I used a similar waveform inside of Serum. And then I have macros for length, thump, which is that that front of the note using a pitch envelope. I have drive and noise. So in this case, I have these tweaked a little bit to get the drum body to my liking. So that's what it sounds like. Then what I did is I rendered that piece out to audio. So that's this next layer here because I wanted to add some processing with effects. So I'll unfreeze this. And you can see inside here, I've added a EQ8 and I have one of the nodes pushing up by 8 dB at exactly 196 Hertz, which is that fundamental of the drum that we saw in the spectrum. And then I have a fairly extreme high pass running in the four pole mode, removing the bottom end of the drum. And that's useful to help the drum to really pop at the fundamental without adding an excessive amount of low frequencies. We also have a saturator, analog clip, a few dB of drive, running 50% in the mix. Now, a lot of people slam their drums 100% using saturation here, and I really like to preserve some of the clean signal because I stack up saturation at a lot of different points in the process, so you gotta be careful not to go too hard too quickly. We can definitely add the saturation in, but I do that in layers. Next up, we have one of my favorite plugins of all time, which is PSP Vintage Warmer. 
Vintage Warmer is a tape saturation plugin, so it does compression as well as saturation. And we have this dialed in with the brick wall limiter on because I really wanted to squash this particular layer of the drum. And we have it tweaked with a bit of drive and a bit of knee. So you can see it is compressing on the VU meter there. Then we have a utility plugin, again, running that narrowing. So it's making this completely mono. There's no reason to have stereo field at all in this piece of the drum. So what I did after is I rendered that track down, and this is the piece that you're actually hearing in the completed drum. So here's the actual rendered synth body. Now, the next piece that I do with this is called topping and tailing. And that is using only the piece of the drum that you need. So we're not going to layer the entire piece of that drum. I'm just going to take the piece that I need. And we can see from the reference drum that between here and here is about where we see that body in the waveform. And so what I did is I used the clip fades, like so. And with the clip fades, it allows me to envelope the drum manually. So you can see what I've done is I've made room at the beginning for the transient. So I've enveloped that in, and then I've allowed that to fade out as the other pieces of the drum come into perspective. Next up, we've got the synth noise, the white noise that you hear that takes up that top end sizzle of the drum. And I've done this again inside of X for Serum. So if we take a look at this track, unfreeze it, you'll see I've got an instance of Serum here. And I have a different preset that I am also going to include in the free download for you guys. This one's called Snare Noise Layer. And it's set up very similarly to how I set up the, the body layer, except this time I'm using the noise oscillator instead of the sub oscillator. We have similar macros for length. We have pitch, drive, and then noise volume. So you guys can just tweak those to your liking. You can also switch up the types of noise inside of Serum. I really like these ARP circuits, pink, white, bright white noise. And then you can also really do well with some of these organics, AC hum, air can, or you can sample and record your own stuff. So in this case, I'm using the bright white one, and this is what the drum sounds like, or the noise rather. So pretty standard white noise, but it's gonna do the trick for us. So what I did with this is I rendered that out to audio, and now you can see this piece, which is the noise tail. So here's the noise tail that's been rendered from Serum. I've done a bit of EQ work on it, removing any low end. And then I've also added more of that drive from the overdrive plugin. I really like this one because of the built-in EQ, the ability to control dynamics, and then the ability to mix it in parallel. So I've tweaked that. And then I've also gain staged this down a bit using a utility device. So continuing on that topic of topping and tailing, you can see I've also used the clip fades here to envelope this drum. And I've done that as well by looking at this waveform and saying, okay, where is the white noise prominent? Well, mainly towards the end. So I've done a nice long fade in, and then I'm tapering it out so that we get that nice tail to the drum. So let's just preview what we have so far. We've got the transient, that little click. We've got the snare body. And then we've got the white noise tail. So those are the pieces so far. Next up, in most of my snare drums, I like to add in an actual acoustic snare sample because the synthesized layers and the white noise layers are all very, they're, they're punchy and they have sizzle to them, but they don't have really a lot of character or texture. So I like to add in a layer of an actual acoustic snare. So I have an acoustic snare drum that I've tuned to that exact same frequency, G196. And you can see where it's peaking. Now I've also added an EQ8 and I've scooped a bit of mids out of it and then done a nice big boost at that fundamental of 196, low passed or high passed out any of the bottom end of it. Now I'm also using Camel Fat here. Camel Fat is one of my favorite devices for the distortion models that you see up here. I'm also using its compressor. Now keep in mind as well, I'm using it in parallel. I'm mixing it in, in the uh, mix control right here, a little bit under halfway. And I'm using the tube, the bit crusher, and then sometimes I use the exciter and the Mac, but in this case, I'm just using the tube and the bit crusher. Then after Camel Fat, 
Let's just solo this. I'm using another one of my favorite drum design plugins, which is from Shack Audio, and it's the Transient Shaper. So it allows you to play with the attack and release phase, and then a hugely useful part of it is Drive, which is going to add a lot of loudness and saturation to the signal. So let's just look at how those guys are stacking up. Here's the original. And then here it is with Camel Fat added. And then Transient Shaper. Let's just do that without the utility plugin on there. Okay. And you can see if I show my clip fades, I'm also using the clip fades here to align this drum in and massage it in there with the synth body, the noise, and then the acoustic layer. Now the final layer I have in here is a Foley recording. And Foley recordings are real recording. So I recorded this with a Zoom H4n field recorder. That's a stereo field recorder. And what I did is actually recorded me bashing two pieces of wood sticks together. Let's unfreeze that. So I was chopping wood the other day for the fire and I bashed a couple pieces of small kindling together just to get a nice wood sound for the front end of the drum to accentuate the click at the front and also to give me a bit of room sound. So the purpose of this Foley layer here is I'm using it to add a bit of stereo feel to the drum. Every other layer that we've seen, except for the noise, has been put into mono. And that's really important for that up the center punch, which you want in a drum. But you also want a little bit of stereo feel and a snare to give you that sense of realism, like it's in a, a proper room. So let's go ahead and just take the effects that I've put on it. I'm going to group them together and turn them off. And that way I can let you hear the original raw sound. So here is the actual Foley recording. So it's just a stick hitting another stick. And then what I've done is added this rack. Now let me walk you through what the rack is doing, but I'll first let you hear it. So this EQ is in mid side mode right here. And what I've done is use that to use both EQs to remove the bottom end because we don't need that. And I'm massively boosting the high shelf here just in the sides. If we look at the mids, those are normal. The sides, I'm giving it a lot of boost to the sides because I want this to take up the stereo field of my signal. I'm also adding the overdrive plugin here to boost up using a bit of distortion. I'm compressing the signal and then limiting the signal after that. So I'm really pushing the hell out of the highs to allow this to stand up in the sides of the mix. And then the final piece of the signal is using a utility device here with the width set out to 200%. So I'm only grabbing the sides of the signal. So here's what it sounds like. And then what I did is just freezed and flattened this to audio. And then we have the Foley layer processed. So here's all of the pieces that we have together without the bus processing on them yet. Now let's take a look at what we have on the bus. So we've got a big rack containing a lot of effects. Let's turn them on and listen to the whole thing together. And here's without. So let's go through each one of these effects. I told you we'd be adding more saturation, and here we go. So we have a saturator, again, 50% in the mix, running analog clip with some drive. Then we have another saturator running medium curve, again, 50% in the mix with some drive. And the reason why I like stacking saturators on saturators is because it's different than pushing one saturator really hard. When you have multiple saturators all running in parallel, then you're effectively layering saturation, layering harmonics on top of already saturated signals, which gives you a fatter, warmer, louder effect. Then we have camel fat again, this time with the bit crusher, a bit of tube, and 50% in the mix, again with a bit of the compressor. Next up, we have EQ. Now, Ableton Live has some pretty sweet drum EQ presets. So if we go under EQ8 right here, and we look under drums, you'll see we have presets for snare drums, three of them. And what I've done is I've racked these up, snare one, two, and three. And those are the presets, but then I've tweaked them. And I've added macros here to choose which one of the EQs. So in this case, I have it over to the right, so I'm using the EQ3. 
And I also have macros set up for low gain, high gain, and mid scoop. So if we take a look at the actual EQ, you can see there's a high pass control, like so. And then we have a low gain, which is boosting up the, the bottom end of the drum quite a bit. High gain, which is pushing up the high notch and giving it some more sizzle on the top. And then we have mid scoop. So if you want to scoop out the mids of the snare, you can do that too. And these macros are set up for all these different EQs. And you can just easily scroll through them to see which one sounds best if you want to use them at all using this macro right here. So it's a really neat way to preview what the drum will sound like with different EQ curves on it. Next up, we have the spectrum. Again, just taking a look at the overall frequency contour of the drum. And then it's running into a glue compressor. So the glue compressor is, this is what it's designed for. It's designed as a bus compressor. And so I'm running it letting a bit of the initial crack through heavy, heavy ratio, 10 to one thresholds down a bit. You can see how much compression we're actually getting. And I also have soft clip engaged. So it's going to add a little bit of distortion and it's going to limit the output. Now, soft clip doesn't work necessarily like a brick wall limiter. So that's what I have afterwards. I have Ableton Live's limiter set up as a brick wall, a bit of boost into the threshold, which is going to shear off those final peaks of the drum and get us the same loudness level as the Vengeance drum. So I'm going to go through and just let you preview what each one of these effects sounds like and then stack them up. So here's with nothing on. Here's with the first saturator. The second saturator. Camel fat. The snare EQ. That's a big difference with that one right there. Now the glue compressor. And you can see, even though we have the glue compressor on with soft clip, we're still clipping our master. And that's what the limiter is for. It's acting as a brick wall limiter to shear off any of those little peaks. And there's the final drum and the final rack. So what I do at that point is I then have a snare bounce track set up. And this is where I can capture the output of that group. So I have the input of this audio track set to be snare layers. I don't use resampling, which is what a lot of people use inside of Ableton Live. And I've found errors with that. I've had inconsistent results using resampling. Sometimes when I resample, there will be um, a few milliseconds of delay, or in some cases, there's a gap between the left and the right channel. And so I'm not too sure what's going on with the resampling function, but I haven't had it operate consistently for me. So instead of doing resampling there out the master bus, I actually just tap that group track directly. And then we grab this as audio. And then you can see I've added that final exported drum back up top. And here we have our final result and comparison. Here's our reference drum we started with. And here's the resulting drum from my process. So that wraps up this video on percussion sound design. Thank you so much for tuning in and watching. Don't forget to grab the free download so you can use my template and save all those tools to your library. Also, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. That way you'll stay up to speed on all of our new releases. Hope to catch you guys soon. Peace.